Independent Component Analysis, or ICA for short, is a method to unmix linearly mixed statistically independent sources or signals. So the concept of blind source separation, as the task is also called, is that you have some signals which are statistically independent and uh, they are mixed by a linear process which we can represent by a 2 by 2 matrix. into two signals which both carry some of these two input signals. And the task now is to undo this mixture again with a linear operation to recover the original sources here on the left side. If the mixing matrix here on the left side is known, this is very simple. And if it's invertible, it's, it's uh, quite simple. So we simply have to use the inverse of M as an unmixing matrix. However, of course, this ma matrix is not known. And we also don't know much about the input signals. The only thing we know is that they should be statistically independent to begin with, right? Because we are, we will use the criterion of stati statistical independence in order to unmix the data. Now, since we don't know the mixing matrix, this problem can fundamentally not be solved perfectly. So what's unclear, of course, is the order of these two. So they can, it could equally well be swapped and the solution would still be a good solution, right? Because the numbering, so the order of the signals cannot be recovered. Also, the signs or the scaling and also the signs, so they could be flipped upside down so that also cannot be recovered. So the linear blind source operation problem is well defined only up to scaling and permutation. Now I said that the assumption is that the two signals are statistically independent. And usually the methods used for ICA are ignorant about the time cause of the signal. So there could be so the, the, I mean, both of the signals have the same number of data points, of course. So there, let's say there are 100 points coming in here from the first source. Let's call it S1. And 100 from the second source, let's call it S2. Then we have mixtures, X1, X2, and we have the unmixed signals, Y1, Y2. Um, these are two components. And for each time slice, so if we pick one time slice here, sort of, right, we get a vector S with indicated with an underscore here. So we get two dimensional vectors at the different time points. So this is the time axis. And since the Temporal structure of the signal is typically ignored. We can view the problem in state space. So we could draw um, the S1, S2 state space. And then simply draw the pairs of points here as points in this um, In this state space. And so if you consider this point, for example, that would tell us, okay, the S1 has this value, S2 has this value, right? And that leads to this point.
So what does it mean now if two signals are statistically independent? Let me give you an example. Let's assume the distribution is a uniform distribution in a square. So this now is our probability distribution over S1 and S2. Yeah. It's uniform within the square and it's zero outside. If we are interested in just one of the two components, we can, for instance, um, draw an axis for S1, so isolated axis here. And then draw the marginal distribution, which would look like this. So this is S1, and this is P of S1. Likewise, we can have a coordinate axis for S2, so the separate, which only concerns S2, and the marginal distribution, again, would be a flat distribution. So this would be P of S2. Yeah. Statistical independence now means that P of S1 and S2, so the joint probability distribution, is the same as the product of the marginals. Yeah. So we can verify this here. If we take the product of this function and this function, we actually get a uniform square because both distributions are uniform and there will be will be zero outside this interval. So this interval has a uniform distribution, but outside it would be zero, here and there would be zero. That leads to the zero areas here and here. And this one here is flat inside and has zero values outside, so that leads to the zero values here and there. So we get something uniform inside and zero outside. Another way to look at that is if we divide this by S2, we get on the left side P of S2 given S1 and here on the right side we just get P of S1. Sorry, that's wrong. P of S1 given S2. Now, this has a somewhat different interpretation. So intuitively this means that knowing S2 doesn't tell us anything about S1 because the condition probability of S1 given S2 is the same as the probability of S1. So if we don't know S2, we get this one. If we know S2, we know this one. And since both are equal, that tells us that S2 doesn't give us any information about S1. So how does that look here in our graph? Well, the idea is if we know S2, so if we know this value, let's say, and if we know it's either this value or this value, does that give us information about the distribution over S1? And if we, if we know S2 as this value, that means we cut through and we have this probability distribution, a flat distribution from here to there. While if we know it's this S2 value, we have a flat distribution along here. And now we see that both distributions, so the top one and the bottom one, they look identical. Um, and that's true for any possible S2 value. Right? I mean, you could say, well, how about an S2 value here? But then there's nothing left. But that's an impossible S2 value, right? So that doesn't count. So, But for any S2 value within this range, 
within this range, we always get the same line here. And that means if I tell you the S2 value, you don't have any additional information about S1. Right? So these are two different versions of what it means to be statistically independent. Now let's rotate the distribution. When we now ask for the marginal distributions, we see we have to project all this data sort of onto this axis, and that leads to a marginal distribution that looks like this. The distributions, by the way, should always be normalized to area one, and that's too big compared to the other ones, so, and it's obvious I'm running out of space. So let's make it a bit more like this, and also this one here would look like this. Yeah, so these would be the marginals. Now if you take the product of the marginals, if x1 and x2 would be statistically independent, we should recover the original two-dimensional distribution, but that doesn't happen. So if we take the product between these two marginals, we actually get something that has a square that covers a whole square. One says it has a square support. And it has wedges along these lines. So it's a bit a funny... It's not quite a pyramid, right? A pyramid would have the wedges along these lines. So it's a bit funny shape. But it has points here because this distribution has points here and this distribution has points here as well, right? So there's some finite probability here. So only, only in this area is the probability zero. So therefore, we have this square support, right? So we see that the product of the marginals, which is the light green shape, differs from the joint probability distribution, which is the dark green area here, right? Also, the dark green is a flat distribution, while the product of these two has a peak in the center, and then it goes down as you go um, to the edges down around here. Right? So, therefore, we see that x1 and x2 are now statistically dependent. You can also play with it with the other um, picture here. So if I tell you that S2 has this value, or it has this value, then you see in the one case, S1 can only be within that range, while in the other case, it could be within that range, right? So knowing S2 gives you some information about S1. We also observe something else that is actually generally true. So, okay, so when I rotate the data distribution here on the left side by 45 degrees to here, I would do that with a mat with a rotation matrix, right? With a 45 degree rotation matrix. Now that actually would, our, would be our mixing matrix. And you can verify with linear algebra sort of that the one component would be the sum or a scaled version of the sum of these two sources and the other one would be the difference. So we know x1 and x2 are now actually uh, mixtures of our originally independent sources here on the left side. Okay, now I wanted to say that there's something else going on. So the one thing we verified that they're not that this rotated distribution is not statistically independent anymore. Uh, and I use this first equation, which indicates the difference between the light green and the dark green distribution. And I also use the second equation, where I see that the distribution over S1 differs when or depends on my knowledge about S2. But there's another thing that goes, goes on here. Namely, here we have a flat distribution, while here we have a triangular distribution. Right? And this distribution looks a bit more Gaussian than this distribution. And we know from a central limit theorem of um, statistics that if you mix statistically independent sources or signals or variables, random variables, if you mix many of them, or actually inf infinitely many of them, you get a Gaussian, no matter what these variables are. So as you mix different components, 
um, the signal becomes more and more Gaussian. And you see this already by just mixing two of these uniformly distributed. You have to mix this one with this one, um, you get this triangular shape. Okay, now we want to revert this process. That's what ICA is about in order to solve the blind source separation problem here. Now, we know already quite a bit about this process of mixing and unmixing would be sort of reverting this process, right? And from what we, from what we know, we could um, base the unmixing on different criteria. For instance, we could say, well, we want to rotate the distribution such that knowing S2 doesn't give us any information about S1. Now, that's not so easy to do. More convenient is to say, well, we want the joint probability distribution to be equal to the marginals. Uh, so you want the light green um, distribution, which is the product of these two marginals, to be equal to the dark green one. And you can imagine if you rotate the dark green one, that the two distributions become more and more similar, right? Until we are in this situation where they coincide completely. For example, you could compare uh, these two distributions with, with um, what is known as a kullback leibler divergence. What you can also do is you can say, okay, I want to make the two components statistically independent, which is the original objective. And there are also measures to do that. For example, you can look at uh, cumulants. So there are ways to do that. Another option would be to say, okay, I want to make these marginal distributions as non-Gaussian as possible, because I know if I mix signals, the mixture becomes more and more Gaussian. If I want to unmix things, I want to make, I have to make them less and less Gaussian, right? So no matter what I do, I would go back to a distribution that looks like this. Yeah, so that's, that's fine and good, but, hmm. It's not so clear. I mean, we know that you can call this Y1 and Y2, but it's not so clear from what I've drawn here whether Y2 coincides with um, S2 or with S1, right? And if I allow not just a plane rotation, but I allow for a general matrix, there could even be a flip in here, right? And that is uh, the ambiguity or the sort of the the part that's not well posed or um, yeah in this blind source separation problem, right? I said you can only recover the sources up to permutation and scaling. Okay, so in this situation, I've assumed that I've mixed my two original signals just by plane rotation, right? So I've assumed that this is just a rotation matrix. Now this is generally not true. We can m can be anything. Uh, I mean, it should be invertible, right, so that I can recover um, the signals. But other, other than that, any metrics would do, right? So what would we do then? Then How does the situation then look? So in that situation, the distribution after mixing might look like this. Now, um, now x1, x2 are actually not only statistically dependent, they're even correlated, which is a stronger statement than being statistically um, dependent. So if you want to make them uncorrelated by rotation, we would just rotate them and the data distribution then would look roughly like this. But that is not statistically independent, right? Because if I tell you this is the S1 value, then you know the S2 distribution is like this. But if S1 value is like this, then it would be, or actually S2 value, right? So S2 is like this, then, so you see different distributions. So 
they are statistically dependent, right? So this is not a good solution. Now, how else can you make data uncorrelated? Now, if you think back to PCA, principal component analysis, we have seen that whitening has a property that the data becomes uncorrelated in all directions. So if we apply whitening, the following happens. We get the two signals x1 hat and x2 hat um, and the overall data distribution, so the joint probability distribution, has been compressed. That's what whitening does, right? It's being compressed in this direction and it's being stretched in this direction until sort of from a PCA point of view it looks like a circle, right? And, um, and this is what a square is. I mean, sounds funny, but as far as PCA is concerned, a square is a circle. Right? I mean, that means it has the same variance in all directions. So after whitening, therefore, we see that we are in a similar situation as we were here, right? And that means from now on, we only have to rotate the data. I mean, we know that whitening turns the distribution to one that has unit variance in all directions, and it is uncorrelated if you project it on two orthogonal axes, sort of, right? No matter how you rotate it, it's always uncorrelated. That's the least you would expect from statistically independent Mm, signals. Yeah, so that's a good start, and that now guarantees that the only c transformation that's being left is the rotation. Yeah, and we have seen how how we can do that. So we can just do the rotation, and then we end up with this. Again, we don't know whether y two corresponds to s two or s one, but anyhow, we have unmixed the two signals. And that's the core of the independent component analysis algorithm for blind source separation.